Hello, everyone. This is the first recording for Plato, a class on the Republic. My plan for today is to offer an introduction to Book One of the Republic and thereby also offer an introduction to the Republic as a whole. And specifically, I want to talk about three topics that come up in the first book and that are of perennial importance for ethical theory. And these three topics come up in the conversations with Socrates' first three interlocutors in this dialogue, that is Cephalus, Polemicus, and Trasimachus. And by looking at topics that come up in these three conversations, I depart a bit from standard approaches to the Republic. It can be quite tempting to move really quickly through the very beginning of the book, where Socrates is talking with Cephalus and Polemicus, and just sort of go right away to his conversation with Trasimachus. Because Trasimachus is one of the most memorable bad guys in Plato's work and offers such intriguing challenges and responses to Socrates' arguments that it is kind of attractive to engage with this in depth and turn to this almost immediately when one starts to read the Republic. However, I want to propose that premises and ideas that come up even earlier in the Republic, in the conversations with Cephalus and Polemicus, are also worth thinking about. Cephalus and Polemicus do not pertain to be philosophers. And the sorts of ideas that come up early on are not as if were sophisticated objections or challenges, which is the case with Trasimachus. Rather, they are more intuitions that are relevant to everyday ethical life. And arguably, ethical theory has to contend with both, with these everyday intuitions, just as much as with sophisticated challenges. So here is the first topic that I want to introduce. When Socrates talks with Cephalus, the question comes up of how we are to think about universal norms or universal rules in relation to virtue. And that is one of the most widely debated questions today in contemporary virtue ethics. So how does this work? Cephalus is a wealthy man who is reflecting on his life. He is fairly old and he thinks that he's going to die soon. And so he says, that, well, the best thing about having been wealthy is that he never did any of these unjust things. Well, what are these unjust things? Then he gives us a list of, as it were, action types, such as deceit, fraud, not returning something that belongs to someone else. And Socrates' response are interesting. I've always wanted to know what justice is. And you are saying, apparently, that justice is to speak the truth and to return things that belong to others. But immediately, once Socrates has formulated that proposal, he raises an objection. And he says, well, Cephalus, if that is kind of your view, then what are you going to say about the following kind of case? Suppose a friend of yours gives you their weapons for safeguarding, and then the friend is drunk and wants the weapons back. Quite likely, you are not going to return what belongs to the other person, and you will probably also not speak the truth in all respects here. So as if we're imagining that the friend says, where are my weapons? And here we have two examples for types of actions that might be quite good candidates for, you know, where we find universal norms compelling, truth-telling, and returning things that belong to others. But we can easily, it seems, come up with a case where we think, well, maybe then there are exceptions. So this passage is often quoted with respect to the 
quite difficult question of whether virtue ethics or a type of ethical theory that puts virtue at its center has any kind of room for universal norms. Okay, turning to the second topic and to the conversation with Polemicus. Cephalus, as ever, hands over to Polemicus, who is his son. And Polemicus says, you know, here is his view on justice. He would turn to Simonides. Simonides is a famous ancient poet. And Polemicus quotes that according to Simonides, one should give to everyone what is owed to them or what is due to them. And then he says, well, as it were, with respect to the case of the friend who is drunk and the weapons, he says, well, and of course, Simonides would somehow add that one should do this reasonably. Now, Socrates responds by saying, hmm, I don't know what Simonides means. And that brief moment, as it were, expresses or flags a problem that is discussed in many approaches in ethics. Namely, it seems that there are some quite abstract principles which, when you hear them, you think, yeah, that, that is compelling. One should do what is reasonable. One should give to everyone what is due to them. But then once you ask yourself, what does that mean? What would I do in order to do what is reasonable? What would I give to others in order to give to them what is due to them? You might feel that is simply not sufficiently action guiding. And the most famous passage on this type of problem is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics Book 6, Chapter 1, where Aristotle says that, well, sure enough, we should do what right reason prescribes. That is true, but not clear. And what that means is that it is true that we should do what is reasonable, but it is not illuminating. It is not sufficiently informative. And once Socrates has, as it were, in just one brief question, made that kind of point, Polemicus says, well, I think what Simonides means is that one should help friends and harm enemies. And that is then refuted by Socrates. And we kind of see that someone who says something that in abstract formulation, such as to give to everyone what is due to them, where that sounds quite compelling, then someone may have in mind that what that means is to help their friends and harm their enemies. And that, as it were, just flags that there could be any number of interpretations for this kind of pronouncement and that really the substance of an ethical theory is going to be the interpretation of this abstract principle rather than the principle itself. And that is an issue that pertains to many, many approaches in ethics. Okay, third topic. Book one of the Republic also presents a function argument. Now, when we think about the function argument, it is quite difficult not to think about Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics simply because Aristotle's function argument formulated in Nicomachean Ethics 1 7 is extraordinarily famous and it is a cornerstone of virtue ethics. Anyone who is at all either objecting against virtue ethics or aiming to develop a version of virtue ethics is going to engage with it. But it is interesting to see that there is also a function argument in Book One of the Republic, which is much less famous, but still worth thinking about. So how does it work? Socrates says that for everything that has a function, and that is a kind of customary technical translation of the Greek term ergon. And 
Literally, that means everything that has a work, a job, something that it does. And we can also say something that has a characteristic activity. Whenever that is the case, then the thing also has a virtue. And the virtue of something is going to be that it engages in its characteristic activity excellently well. So what is going to be the function of the human soul? Socrates says the function of the human soul is to govern, to deliberate, and to take care of things. And then he says, as it were, without criticizing this suggestion, well, the function of the soul is to live. Now, you may think those are two claims. <laughs> they are not saying the same thing. And if we were to claim that it is the function of the human soul to deliberate and to govern and to take care of things, then we would be, given our premises, committed to the further claim that hence the virtue of the human soul is to deliberate well, to govern well, to take care of things well. But Socrates goes with his second pronouncement. He says, okay, so the function of the human soul is to live, and hence the virtue of the human soul is to live well. And then, doesn't it seem that someone who lives well is happy? Yeah, sure. And then, all of a sudden, it looks like we have demonstrated what is one of the most contested demonstranda of the Republic, namely that someone who is virtuous is happy. And that may seem surprising. That was a pretty fast argument for something that has been presented as really contentious. Now, at the end of the first book of the Republic, this is precisely how Socrates assesses things. He says he thinks he moved too quickly. He's not happy. And he would like to think more and more deeply about the sorts of things that have been discussed in the conversation so far. And sure enough, there are going to be books 2 to 10 to think more deeply about these matters. But I want to propose by way of conclusion that each of the three themes that I sketched a little bit gives us an important takeaway. And that is to some extent only, you know, something that I'm saying by way of example, because there is a lot more going on in book one, and there aren't just these three takeaways. But given the three things that we discussed, I want to propose that one question to take away is, what is Plato going to say about universal norms? Do they have any place in a theory of justice? Second. Is he going to return at all throughout the Republic to the question of these highly abstract principles such as give to everyone what is owed to them and do they have a place in his proposal or not? And three, we can sort of already see from this short function argument that a lot is going to hang on what we will say the human soul does because presumably that is going to help us formulate a theory of virtue in the human soul. So we will need to ask, well, what are the activities of the human soul? And that actually is going to be one of the biggest themes in the Republic.